Good afternoon, one and all. Uh, thank you for joining us and uh, warm welcome. Myself, Dr. Anirudha Babar from Department of Political Science. I'm a Dot Talks coordinator as well as a coordinator of uh, Dr. D.R. Ambedkar lecture series, which we have been uh, organizing since last uh, couple of months. So I'm really proud to announce uh, uh, to all of you that uh, today we are going to organize a sixth lecture in the series. And this lecture will be delivered by uh, delivered by Professor Somprata Chaudhary, who is an associate professor at the School of uh, Arts and Aesthetics, Jawala Nehru University. Uh, Professor Chaudhary has also authored uh, theater, number, event, three, uh, three studies on the relationship between sovereignty, power, and the truth, Ambedkar and other immortals, an untouchable research program and articles on ancient Greek liturgy, the staging of Ibsen, psychoanalysis, Fule, Nietzsche, Ambedkar, and Hegel. Uh, Professor Sambrata's uh, latest book is now It's Come to Distances, Notes on Coronavirus and Shahin Bagh, Association and Isolation. First of all, I'm really grateful to Professor Sambhita Chaudhary, you know, for his time as well as uh, uh, his uh, enthusiasm to to participate in our lecture series. Uh, well, as you know, this is a very ambitious project uh, undertaken by uh, Department of Political Science in collaboration of Dot Talks team as well as Tetsu College. And uh, in the future, also we are going to have uh, many more speakers to come, and uh, this lecture series is going to continue in the interest of the college, in the interest of the students, and also in the interest of the society at large. That is actually the purpose behind this initiative, to enlighten the society about the relevance and significance of Dr. B.R. Ambedkar today and tomorrow. So uh, going forward with the lecture series, uh, Dr. Somprata will be speaking on uh, beyond protective discoloration, Ambedkar on Karvajan. So with this word, uh, I request uh, Dr. Dr. Chaudhary to kindly please uh, uh, take over the virtual stage and please start with the presentation. Uh, sir, over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You're clear. Oh, yeah. Very, very good for uh, uh, both the invitation and these kind words and I'm really happy to deliver this lecture as part of the uh, ongoing B.R. Ambedkar lecture series. Um, today I'd like to speak to you on uh, Ambedkar's uh, relationship to conversion. As uh, we all know that Ambedkar uh, uh, himself towards the very end of his life converted to Buddhism in the year 1956, uh, which was not simply an individual, a case of individual conver conversion, uh, but a massive mass conversion of lakhs of people from a particular section of society, from a section of society, uh, Ambedkar himself came. So uh, this event of conversion in 1956, just a few months before Ambedkar uh, died in December 1956, was something so um, so momentous and uh, so spectacular uh, that we uh, tend to think that uh, Ambedkar's uh, conversion itself uh, happened in uh, a particular kind of uh, immediate and extremely forceful manner uh, as part of a mass movement of that section of society which was the victim of an age-old Hindu upper caste practice of untouchability. And so uh, they were, this section of society was a uh, at that time, almost officially called by the name untouchable. Now, it is, of course, true that after 
India's independence, the very name untouchable is by law a criminal to call anyone an untouchable is a criminal act. But at that time, uh, despite a lot of legal provisions, which even with the colonial British government uh, had been um, had emerged in relation to the practice of untouchability, the name untouchable was still by and large taken as a matter of something to taken for granted in Hindu society. And so in 1956, a few years after the India, uh, after the independence of of India from colonial rule, uh, when a whole lot of people who belonged to these untouchable sections of society, which is also called castes of untouchable castes of Indian society, they converted and they converted to a particular religion, which is Buddhism. It was an act of massive significance and it struck the imagination and the attention of much of the upper caste Hindu society as well as other sections of society who were victims of other kinds of uh, traditional social oppression and marginalization. The very fact that such an act was possible for such a large number of people in one stroke as part of one event seemed to become almost like a call, almost like a certain kind of announcement that conversion was possible from Hindu social order and Hindu religion to other forms of religions and social life, not just for individuals and groups, but as part of a mass movement. In that sense, with reason, you could say that the 1956 event was part of conversion, not just as a religious and social act, but as part of a political movement, or it was a political act. So, because of the magnitude of Ambedkar and a large number of people from untouchable castes in Maharashtra at that time who converted to Buddhism in 1956, because it was an event of such a, like I said, massive and spectacular proportion that often we tend to think that conversion was an instantaneous event. It happened in a kind of instantaneous, spectacular uh, way. But actually, Ambedkar's relationship to the question of conversion was far more complex in the at least 30 years of his public life. And today I'd like to go back a little from 1956 to a kind of middle period of Ambedkar's public life when Ambedkar was already thinking of conversion, though he was not actually, at that time at least, he did not actually announce the name of any particular religion to which he made a call to the untouchable castes to convert. So we have to distinguish in Ambedkar's thinking and his own public life. We have to distinguish between the actual conversion, which could be called Ambedkar's conversion as part of, like I said, a massive social and political movement that took place in 1956 and Ambedkar on conversion, or Ambedkar's thinking on conversion, which actually persisted through a long period of time, from at least the early 1920s, in a particular way it intensified, or it became more prominent in public discussions in the year 1935 and 1936, the years 1935 and 1936. And then in 1956, Ambedkar and lakhs 
of other untouchable or people from the untouchable castes converted. So we can actually divide Ambedkar's relationship to the question of conversion into these three periods, or at least not, if not strictly periods, but at least three stages. Today, for this lecture, I would like to talk to you about the second stage of Ambedkar's relationship to conversion. But before I do that, again, we have to be very clear that by and large, overall, what the three stages consisted in. The first stage consisted in Ambedkar's acute realization from at least 1920s when he came back from America and other uh, well foreign foreign universities where he was studying uh, and started uh, actually practicing both a kind of professional life but also eventually a public political life in India in the 1920s. Ambedkar acutely realized that the practice of untouchability and all the terrible discrimination that followed from it could only be understood in a deeper way through the particular kind of codification and legitimation that this form of discrimination had gained from what he called the texts of Hindu religion, the sacred or great or the legitimizing books and texts of Hindu religion. Now, this does not mean that the origin of untouchability is in a text. Ambedkar had very clearly analyzed this question of the genesis or the origin of untouchability as well as caste in Indian society from his earliest great work in 1916, which he presented as part of a lecture uh, 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 seminar presentation during his studies in America in Columbia University, a text called Castes in India, Genesis, Transmission, Development, so on and so forth. Not exactly that title, but more or less that's the idea. Uh, Genesis, Mechanism, Transmission, Development, something like that. Uh, in that text, uh, Ambedkar had said that the origin of caste does not lie in a text or in a you know Hindu religious book. The origin is social. The origin is a kind of set of practices which needs to be analyzed and, and studied very carefully. But at the same time, texts are great legitimators. And not, a, not only are they legitimators of untouchability and caste practices, but texts provide a kind of stability, a kind of structural grid where these practices can be repeated again and again. So that's why texts are extremely important as intermediate stabilizing mechanisms, as structures. Because what they do is they repeat the things that have been happening in the past so that they will now also happen in the future. So texts occupy this middle position between the past and the future. They become codes of repetition. And of course, the texts can be of different kinds. They can be philosophical texts, they can be cultural texts, they can be literary texts, and so legal texts, very importantly, legal texts. They can be of many kinds. But in taken in totality, texts provide a kind of stable, repeatable structure for society to enact its practices, even though texts are not at the origin of those practices. Anyway, that's a different question, but the, the, the question is, for Ambedkar in the 1920s, that these texts hence need to be read in a different way. They need to be demystified. They need to be read not as sacred religious texts, but through those texts, the very nature of a religion needs to be analyzed and demystified so that the possibility of thinking outside that religious structure becomes possible becomes uh, uh, that possibility uh, emerges for people 
who otherwise think that the question of religion is something over which they have no power, they have no choice. This is the most important thing for Ambedkar. That it is, of course, a fact in the 1920s, just like it is still in, in a different way, a terrible fact that there is caste discrimination, violent caste discrimination. There is caste atrocity. And there is at that time openly and now probably in a more complicated and secret way, practices of untouchability, of exclusion, of physical exclusion. That is a fact. No one can deny it. But what Ambedkar was more keen to bring out was that do the people who are victims, the question that he wanted to raise before anything else was that do the people who are victims of this practice of untouchability, do, is it within their power to think outside untouchability? Because clearly for the oppressors, for the caste Hindus, for the upper castes. It is a matter of something which they enjoy. They enjoy the privileges that society gives them from their births onwards. And so it is in their interest to perpetuate the system. But clearly for the, un, for, the, for, the, for the people who are victims of this very practice, it is not in their interest to perpetuate the system. Uh, uh, it is not in their interest to perpetuate this uh, system. But at the same time, if they want to in any way exit the system, come out of the system, then is it within their power, forget actually making such an exit possible, is it even within their power to conceive, to think of this possibility of exit? This was Ambedkar's main question. In that sense, it was a political question. If politics means to act collectively through our independent collective capacities, powers. So here, politics does not mean simply uh, something which belongs to the province of the state and uh, you know law and so on and so forth. That, of course, is there. But more fundamentally, politics means something which is a uh, which is a capacity, a collective public capacity. So Ambedkar's question in that sense was political. But is it within the power of the untouchable castes to even think of the possibility of exiting, of moving out of this entire system, which is what Ambedkar called a system of castes? This is the question. And I'd like to uh, bring out this question in these three parts. The first is the early part of Ambedkar's public life in, in around 1920s, uh, let's say. Uh, at that time, in the different newspapers in Marathi that he was editing and writing for and other forums, public speeches and other kinds of things, in some of the representations that he made to the different British, uh, for instance, the Simon Commission and other kinds of British uh, uh, forums where uh, the colonial uh, government was also trying to amass and systematize information uh, from the different sections of Indian society to produce certain institutions, like, for instance, the institution of a census, fr from where the question of caste census still, you know, is relevant for us. Is there a proper caste census or do we need a new caste census today? So these kinds of institutions were uh, actually for their own convenience and for their own uh, a colonial instrumentality for the colonial you know, benefits uh, the British government uh, created, for which they amassed a lot of information. And they also uh, had several kinds of forums where different sections of society made their representations. So Ambedkar actually made a lot of representations on behalf of the untouchable castes. And Ambedkar uh, spoke of the kind of social order to which the untouchables apparently belonged, which was a peculiar social order, which he called 
a social order which is anti-social. Because a social order which both requires a part of its members to provide services, to do labor, to actually be part of the entire uh, system of uh, in the organizing uh, the different activities of the totality, they are there. But at the same time, in social life, they are discriminated to the point that they are treated as almost non-humans, or they are not treated at the same level as social humanity, makes that very totality anti-social. So that's why Ambedkar's characterization of so-called Hindu society was that Hindu society is anti-social by this very logic. It is a society which requires people which that society does not treat as part of social humanity. Hence, it is a contradictory society. And he made these representations in terms of the actual statistics, the actual data, the actual um, the, the, the actual numbers that the untouchable castes formed, uh, at least at that time in the 1920s and early 1930s. Eventually, of course, all of these representations would go into early 1930s when Ambedkar would demand on behalf of the untouchable castes as part of a new political form of representation, which was electoral representation, when the very name untouchable would now eventually institutionally change to what at that time was called depressed classes into a new official name, which in a sense already started criminalizing the name untouchable. That you could, you, if you use the word untouchable, you already did it criminally. That is, you, you were already a, a, a kind of social criminal, even if you are not a you know legal criminal by 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 calling one part of society untouchable. So that's why Ambedkar uh, spoke of depressed classes as a social category. But he wanted depressed classes to have political representation, autonomous political representation, which led, of course, to the great uh, quarrel in Indian history between Ambedkar and Gandhi during the roundtable conferences uh, in the 19th, early 1930s. But you see, at that time, there was another kind of social movement which Ambedkar was part of and yet not at the center of. A social movement was, uh, which was taking place in different parts of the country. Uh, it was taking place in Maharashtra. It was also taking place in Kerala, in South of India. And that was called the temple entry movement, where the untouchable castes, one of the key sites or spaces in which untouchability was practiced was the religious space of the temple, where, uh, where uh, these people from certain castes were not allowed to enter, or if they were allowed to enter, they were allowed to enter in extremely, um, in extremely restrictive ways. For instance, the, the access to what was called the, in, in Hindu, um, in Hindu terms, uh, but in general, it, it, it is true for all religions, uh, the Garbhagraha or, or the sacred sort of the most sacred center of a temple architecture or the temple space. So they were extremely restrictive or entirely excluded in this very spatial organization of the temple. So a uh, movement was initiated by different, uh, not just Ambedkar. Ambedkar was not really one of this uh, at the heart of this movement though he did play a part in this movement, Gandhi was definitely at the heart of this movement, as well as other leaders and other people from other parts of the country, uh, where a demand was, was, was raised that people should be allowed to enter these temples and take part in all the religious activities that a temple consists in. In that sense, a kind of religious equality was demanded. But of course, Ambedkar noticed the logical problem there, which was that uh, religion was, of course, the name for something which was a set of ritual practices from where untouchable castes were excluded. The people from untouchable castes were excluded, no doubt. But religion was not just the name of a ritual space. Ambedkar w knew by this time very well that religion was the name of society or a social order. So the, the very 
understanding of religion had to be broadened. Religion was already a social and political affair where people through religion were exercising power over others. So discrimination did not only take place within so-called religious codified religious spaces. That is the temple here. So even if in certain matters there was reform and improvement in uh, the, the, the religious practices within the temple space, so untouchables would be allowed up to a certain point or you know uh, certain restrictions would be lifted. All of that might happen. But for Ambedkar, the question remained, would this actually have be a real historical intervention in the entire social order, which we call Hindu, like I said, uh, like he said, Hindu non-social social order or anti-social social order? Would it be enough? And to that extent, a tactical question had to be raised, politically that is, that would the energies that would be, you know, expended in, uh, in uh, being part of such a movement of temple entry, uh, the right to temple entry, would it be worth expending that energy uh, considering the, the possibility that the rest of society would still remain by and large discriminatory and governed by the larger precepts of Hindu social caste order. So Mitkar was somewhat hesitant about um, devoting all one's energies to the temple entry movement. And eventually Ambedkar uh, probably also took a kind of step back from the temple entry movement. Because for him, uh, however um, um, much you might try and uh, institute certain reforms within the, uh, the, 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 the ritual system, part of the ritual system, uh, and he made a very, very pertinent comment here, that uh, the practice of untouchability was a was not a specialized practice, specialized ritual practice. It was a total practice. It was a practice which consisted in 24-7, 365 days all the time, while ritual practice remains specialized to the temple space. So in that sense, what was really important for Ambedkar was again to ask this question, which is, is it within the powers of the people who belonged to the untouchable castes to think not just in terms of uh, specific reform movements, which is of course important up to a point, uh, but uh, to think structurally, to think, um, well, theoretically of the possibility of exiting the entire social order that he called Hindu anti-social social order. It is in this context that in the middle 1930s, Ambedkar, uh, as part of the caste from which he came, he was born into uh, the Mahar caste in Maharashtra, the Mahar caste. Uh, as part of that caste, uh, a whole uh, series of uh, conferences, public discussions were being held at that time. This was not limited to one caste. These were uh, conferences that were held um, by different forums. I mean, the so-called Hindu Mahasabha at that time was also holding conferences. The Congress was holding conferences. Uh, so were the people from depressed classes. And the Mahar caste in particular held some really significant conferences in this period. So there were at least two conferences in 1935 and 1936, which are very important in this context. One is the 1935 conf uh, conference of YOLA, Y-E-O-L-A, YOLA, where Ambedkar in his public address uh, actually said something which shocked a lot of people. And actually he said something so clear that in a way the stakes of what he was trying to do became absolutely um, unmistakable for everyone. And he said that uh, I was, it was, it was not up to me to be born where I was born. And I was born in a particular social order that is Hindu, where I occupied a certain place. And it was not in my power. That place was the place of an untouchable. But it is within my power 
to not, and this was the key phrase that he used, to not die a Hindu, not die a Hindu. I will not die a Hindu. It is within my power not to die a Hindu. Even if I, I was born a Hindu, because I had no control over that. This was a very, very, very uh, striking thing that he said, which really shocked a lot of people from all quarters, from the upper caste, but also from the depressed classes. But still then, by and large, the ambit or the horizon of social movements was that of reform within the caste structure and the social order of Hindu society. But for the first time, Ambedkar said something at a kind of, how should one put it, existential level. Within his, from his own solitary voice, he uttered these words. It is within my power not to die a Hindu. Now, there are two things that we notice here. One is, of course, this tremendous declaration of not dying a Hindu. In that sense, he has to do something to, to, to you know, to, to, to cancel his, 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 uh, uh, belonging to Hinduism as something over which he had no control because he was born into that particular social order. That is one thing. But the other thing is, of course, this very question of, like I said, power, that he could say that it is within my power to do something about my, my situation. So you see, he's saying that you, we are born into situations. Hinduism is a kind of social situation, just like we are born into any other situation whether it's a religious situation or social, family, nation, is also a situation over which we have no choice. But is it within our power to do something about our situation? And doing something can mean many things. It can mean to analyze our situation, that our situation is not something which is given to us from some force which is beyond our control, in the sense beyond our control to think. For instance, religion could be think uh, could be understood in a kind of uh, you know in a, in a man in a, through the through the point of view of divinity, which is such an immense power beyond human power that you think that you say that no no human beings really can't do anything about religion because it comes from a power above human beings. That's one way. Or you think of it as destiny. That maybe my situation in life is very bad, but it is a destiny. What can I do about it? So Ambedkar's question was, is it possible to, in a sense, refuse this kind of framework of divinity, which is surplus over human beings, destiny, which is also a kind of fatality, which strikes human beings from a place which you do not really understand. And it is in this context that uh, Ambedkar uh, actually speaks with that kind of force of the will. So in terms of political philosophy, I think we can think of Ambedkar as a person who, in the most difficult of situations existentially, because he belongs to a caste which is physically excluded, which has no power in terms of social institutions, which is, de which is humiliated and degraded and everything that we know about untouchability, from that very lowest position of, you know, social existence, is it possible to assert one's will, one's, how should one put it, subjecthood, that I am a subject of my situation, or at least in my situation, I can force my subjective desire to change the situation. So in other words, is it possible, A, to think of your situation, and B, if you are able to think of your situation, is it possible to think of the possibility of changing that situation or your relationship to that situation? These are very basic but very important questions which Ambedkar, in a sense, forced into the public gaze at that time. First in 1935 in Yala, when he said that he will not die a Hindu, from which, of course, immediately the specter arose of conversion that the only way you will not die a Hindu is by moving out of your religion, by willing to move out of Hindu religion and, you know, probably convert to some other religious fold, religion, uh, religion and religious and social order and so on and so forth. 
So this was the first uh, point. But the second point was uh, came out in immediately after that in 1936, when uh, as part of these conferences that I mentioned, uh, a Mahar conference that took place in Bombay in 1936, a resolution was passed by the entire Mahar, the untouchable people who gathered to think together, uh, following from the Yola Declaration, but this time it came out as a resolution, and the, uh, the Mahar resolution, the Mahar conference resolved to abandon Hinduism and be open to the possibility of converting to some other religion. Now, you will notice that it was not said they would convert to this religion or that, but the very possibility of moving out of Hinduism was something that was officially and collectively stated as part of the resolution of the 1936 Bahar Conference. And Ambedkar himself made a public ad address again during that uh, conference. And again, in that conference, Ambedkar uh, raised the question of uh, this kind of a collective will to do something about the situation into which they were born because it was not within their power. And uh, he actually expressed himself in a very interesting form in this case. He didn't only speak uh, in, a, in an analytical or a, in a, in a you know, in a discursive way that uh, normally you speak to explain something. He actually spoke in terms of a certain kind of, um, a kind of poetic form. He gave a whole series of prescriptions, of declarations, of poetic dictates to his people, to all the people that were there. And uh, some of those dictates are very interesting if you read them, and you can read them in, you know, texts which uh, Eleanor Zelliot has the next, uh, you know, a pioneering work on Ambedkar's life and his work. So she has cited uh, the whole series of uh, what she calls public litany, you know, in a kind of poetic, repetitive manner. So this idea of an alternative form of life is brought out by Ambedkar. But what is the crux of this kind of a prescription, this kind of an announcement? The crux is that we must think of a religious form of life which is based on reason, which is based on a kind of ethical use of reason, moral use of reason. So actually Ambedkar speaks of two things at the same level, it seems. One is religion, which is a kind of social order a social form of existence which has a strong ritual dimension and of course which has great theological texts to you know support it and at the same time Ambedkar uh, speaks of reason which is a universal human capacity which Ambedkar in another place says is not a Brahmin's prerogative it is nobody's monopoly this is Ambedkar's statement Thinking is no one's monopoly, which of course, you know, points towards the Brahmanical, um, the sense of Brahmins having monopoly over the function of thinking, the pundits and so on and so forth, the textual writers, the, main, the ones who make texts as codifications of so-called thinking. All of that we know. So, but here it's a practical uh, point that he's making. He's saying that we must actually change our situation according to these two principles. One is the principle, which is a universal principle of reason, which is all human beings possessing that capacity. And the second is the principle of a social order, which he accepts as crucial to social existence, which is religion. So in that sense, you can't call him anti-religious ever. But at the same time, he says that a religion, which is not a contradiction of reason, which doesn't contradict reason. Now, this is, of course, a very tricky point. That how does one produce a particular kind of form of life, which is a collective form of life, and yet it is something which is practiced through those very acts of repetition, 
which are habits, which are rituals, which could also be, you know, uh, practices organized within certain kinds of values and gods and divinities and so on and so forth. All of that on the one hand, and other, uh, on the other hand, this kind of this kind of a corporate social order would be seamlessly flowing from universal human reason. Is it possible? Because wouldn't a corporate, which is basically a local body, a single religion, claim a kind of superiority over other corporates, just like one religion claims that it is better than the other religion, just like one society, one nation, claims that it is a greater nation than the other nation. Insofar as these are all kind of corporate bodies, these are, these are separate bodies, separated, one is separated from the other. But human reason is not separate, it is inseparable from each and one, each one of us. Is, how is it possible to now both constitute something which is a separate form of a specific religion and at the same time to make that separate form continuous and non-contradictory with the universal principle of reason. This was the challenge that Ambedkar actually took up throughout his life, from at least that period in 1935 up to the end of his life. But in 1936, after the Mahar conference in Bombay, uh, Ambedkar actually wrote, and I want to just talk about that for a little bit, uh, wrote a text, which is quite an extraordinary text, which I have addressed in my book on Ambedkar, uh, which is called Away from the Hindus. And it is written in the wake of the Maha resolution of both deciding to abandon Hinduism, but also to be open to converting to some other religion. And in this text, Ambedkar uh, writes about uh, the meaning of conversion or the significance of conversion as not simply uh, believing in one religion in so far as you believe in the theology of that religion. You believe, for instance, the idea of God in a particular religion, not really as a belief system, but it is a theory of conversion which is based on a particular understanding of the place of religion as something which is both a form of fraternity, a form of uh, togetherness, a form of sociability, which you need to constitute a proper society. And hence he said you need religion. But at the same time, he also, and this is again going back to the earlier problem of religion and reason, also he wants this kind of a religion to provide a particular kind of alternative to the existing social order where religion is unthought. So this is the distinction that he wants to make a religion which is to be thought through the capacity of human beings to think. So religion is something to choose because it is necessary to have religion, but at the same time to choose according to the requirements and parameters of reason, of thinking, against a religion which is unthought. So this is really his main point, that Hinduism is unthought. And, we, and when we are born into something, we are born into something unthought. This is the main point that he's making. That simply being born into a society or nation means that we are born into it because we have no choice, which means it is unthought. We have not thought because there is no way to find a position outside uh, like what is in science is called an Archimedean position. You know, it's outside that space. So we can't think it. So people will say this is what it is. You have to just live with this. Good or for, for you know, better or for worse. So here he's saying that no, we need to make religion rise to the level of thought, into the light of thinking. In that sense, we must both 
now start thinking about religion. This is the main announcement that he's making in 1935 and 36. Till now, religion has been unthought. And hence our oppression, our, our, our discrimination, our degradation is something which we have experienced, but we have not been able to think of our experience in relation to the situation in which we are born. Because to be born into a situation is not within our power. To be born or not be born is not within our power. But now the time has come to think of that very condition. But to do it, we need to find a point outside. How does one do it? So this is the tricky part, that you have to think it, but not absolutely like a neutral observer, because there is no neutral position. Yeah. So while thinking it, you have to actually also move out of the situation. But you have to move out of the situation to a point which is thinkable, because otherwise you'll be just going from one, one, th un, one unthought condition to another unthought condition. So conversion, the bad sense of the term, or at least conversion understood in the in the in the mechanical sense that it is something that you know in in modern law and we can we'll talk about that in the discussion i hope in 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 modern rational law uh conversion as something which is done forcefully or through inducement is considered illegal why because it is something which you have not thought about so you have not chosen it this is the idea this is the principle that if you choose to convert so it's part of a freedom but if it's unthought, then it's not part of your freedom. It's mechanical or it's forced or it's induced. So Ambedkar is saying that, yes, we have to now think of the possibility of converting to some other religion. But we have to think of that possibility from an outside point, which means that at some point we must also move out. We have to do both things at the same time. We have to both think of that outside point and we have to also sort of, you know, gamble on some name on some religion to which we must move out to both things at the same time because we don't have the luxury of a neutral so-called academic it's not an academic question so in 1936 he actually produces a text which he calls it's a nice word he uses he calls it's an airy text it's an airy text airy in the air why he says this is a kind of strange moment we are in we are neither any more unthought members of Hindu society or we are members of an unthought Hindu society because now we are we have been able to think of our relationship to Hindu society because Hindu society is structurally, textually, ideologically and so on and so forth an anti-social social order. So we have been able to think of its essential feature. So there we have already exercised our freedom as universal thinking beings. So that much we've been able to do. So once we've been able to do that, Ambedkar says, now, because we haven't actually converted to any other religion, this is a time for thinking abstractly of the concept of conversion. So he says, theory is a kind of airy activity. There's something slightly abstract in the air, but that Airy activity is not purely uh, speculative. It's not purely self-indulgent. It is happening in that in-between period when you have been able to think of the possibility of moving out of Hinduism, but you have not converted to any other religion. It is exactly at that time that you can think of conversion as a concept. This is the text called Away from Hindus. Now you will notice something extraordinary. Till now, by and large, what we know is that texts of conversion are produced, great texts of conversion, are produced by religious thinkers, propagandists, proselytizers, and so on and so forth, who actually belong to the religion which is calling out for conversion, which, which is saying that convert to our fold. So you'll find you know, different kinds of uh, texts like that. And there are these monotheistic religions, Christianity, Judaism, Islam, which in a sense are, are st structurally and legitimately conversional religions. So in that sense, proselytizing is part of their structure. And you have texts along those lines. But Ambedkar's text is one of those extraordinary rare exceptions 
where the theory of conversion is provided by the one who is to convert. It is not a, 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 a theory of conversion which is coming from the religion which claims that it is a greater religion or it is a religion which you know is worth converting to. It is actually coming from a particular section of society which is not part of any, at least it has not found any desired religion, and yet it sees the importance of religion. So that's why Ambedkar does two things at the same time, which is on the one hand, he produces a theory of conversion, but on the other hand, he also produces a theory of religion itself as a religion of reason, which he also sometimes calls a religion of responsibility. And if responsibility comes from human freedom, you could also say this is a religion consistent with human freedom. So it is actually, actually coming from the other side. The one who is to convert is producing a general universal theory of conversion in religion, rather than the usual quarter from which these theories come, which is the majority religion or the powerful religion, which produce such texts of theology, conversion, and so on and so forth. This is an extraordinary methodological point, which we must, you know, uh, uh, keep in mind. Anyway, so what is the text? Now here Ambedkar actually makes a very concrete point. He says, primarily religion is the human being as addressed by an identity. Religion is a kind of identity. Religion is something which identifies us or discerns us, in which we gain a particular personality, a particular figure, you know, like, uh, in, like in art, if you make a sculpture, if you make a painting, it has a figure, it has a form. Religion gives us a form. And that form has a name. So in other words, religion is a name. This is Ambedkar's main point. Religion is actually a name. So when someone asks us, who are we? then the answer that we are Christians or Muslims or Hindus or whatever is actually the name from where a whole series of identifications follow in society. So religion is a name. But the experience of a name can be very different within the same religion for different parts of that religious society or that social order of that religion. So that's why he says that the name untouchable is very different from the name, say, Brahmin. The name which is, you can say, touchable. Though both apparently are part of the name Hindu. The name untouchable is by its very nomination a bad name, a degraded name. It is a name which is criminal. Eventually today it's criminal. And, you know, we, we can see why because that name, there is something which is degraded and obscene about the name itself. And yet it is part of the naming of religious naming of society, that some people are asprashya or achurth, you know, untouchable, whichever word you use at that time, which is not the case with Brahmin or Kshatriya or the other Varnas. The name Shudra is also like the name untouchable, small, degraded, uh, servant, slave, whatever. So the name Hindu or the, or the religious name itself is a kind of crypt. It's a kind of mask for other names. Or you can call it in my work, I've called it name effect. There is a kind of name effect. So that's why Mbitkar says that the untouchable feels the need for what he calls protective discoloration. Now, this, of course, is a term from zoology, from, you know, the life sciences, where certain animals, they uh, camouflage themselves when they are in the danger of being attacked, threatened by predator, predators. Uh, so they assume, for instance, the color of the uh, of the neighboring forest, the, the, the green, the greenery, and they assume a color where the or the wolf or the, or, the, or, or the leopard is not able to identify through the color the actual animal that is threatened. So this is called in, in a kind of uh, language of zoology, 
and ethology, uh, you know, science of animal behavior, protective discoloration. So he says, precisely in the same way, though he doesn't really explain it, but it's the, the nature of the metaphor is so clear. He says that the untouchable has to try and protect herself or himself by discoloring the appearance, the figure. Before whom? Who is the predator? The upper caste Hindu. So this is the contradiction is clear. While on the one hand, you have the distinction between animals which are predators and, you know, um, the, 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 the threatened animals. Here we are human beings, apparently part of the same universal species or the species being of a universal human being. But and yet there is a fundamental distinction which is enacted through one part of it being threatened, the other part being the predator against which you have to assume some sort of animal tactics. So what is the tactic? He says, well, the tactic that a lot of, and this is of course a historical point, a lot of untouchable castes have assumed is the tactic of assuming new names from within the cultural history or the cultural traditions of India, Indic cultural traditions. So he gives the example that, uh, for instance, the Mahar castes, which is an untouchable name, Mahar, has called itself Sokamela. Why? Sokamela is the name of a great Mahar saint, a saint poet, the Bhakti movement. And in fact, during the temple entry movement, there was a whole, uh, you know, uh, campaign to institute a temple for Sokamela, which Ambedkar did not actually support. He thought it was kind of a waste of energy. So he says that the 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 uh, the Mahar calls himself Sokamela. The name Sokamela, or for instance, uh, you have uh, the Bhangi, the obscene, the criminal name Bhangi, who which which is enjoined, which is um, you know, which is which is forced to uh, undertake degraded manual labor. It is called. It calls itself Valmiki, as a new name. So he says all these new names are actually not part of some kind of deeper subalternity, some deeper desire to go back to some other tradition. These are tactical moves like a threatened animal makes a tactical move of discoloring or camouflaging itself against a predator. Similarly, the untouchable caste assumes a new name so that the, uh, the upper castes are not able to identify you. But he says, and he goes on further, he says something extraordinary. He says, if they were all away from their locality, they would all call themselves Christians. In 1936, he's saying this. If they were all away from their localities, they would all call themselves Christians. The Valmiki, the Mahar, uh, 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 Chakamela, the Madiga, uh, Arun, uh, Arunadot, all of them would call themselves Christians. What does he mean? Is he saying that Christianity is the religion to convert to in an ideal way? No, uh, there is nothing to suggest that he is, though of course he has very serious uh, reflections on Christianity as a possible option to convert to, just like Islam and Sikhism are also there. But there is nothing to say that Christianity is a preferred religion. What he's saying is probably that Christianity is the new name which colonialism and British rule has introduced to the Indian population, which is a new name, which has a kind of, kind of, uh, you know, universal force at that time. It has a tactical position. Christian means that the possibility of calling yourself by a new strange name and yet a strange name which is through colonial and British, you know, and missionary. Um, uh, and there's a whole text called Christianizing the Untouchables by Ambedkar. The whole history of Christianity far early, uh, you know, beyond colonial rule from early, maybe 15th, 16th century, at least the history of Christianity in India has been written about by Ambedkar. Anyway, but when he says Christians here, he does not mean this historical uh, you know, reality of Christianity. What he means is Christian as a logical possibility, as a new name which can act like a mask for 
the real degradation of Hindu social order. But he says it is still not possible at this point because you, you have to be away from your locality, which you cannot be. You're still too much part of Hindu social order. You're too much part of Hindu society. So that's why he's saying that the untouchable castes have to try and find at this point a, mid, a kind of middle place. Neither Christianity, which is too much of a of, of, of a kind of too much of a conversion. So Christianity basically means conversion. If you call yourself a Christian, you have converted. But if you call yourself a Valmiki, you have not really converted. If you call yourself uh, a, 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 a Sokhamila, you have not really converted. But at the same time, you are not absolutely Hindu either. There is a kind of intermediate position. But he says the difficulty is that in the upper caste village, the locality, what he calls locality, in the actual locality, the upper caste village, from where the, uh, the, the untouchable is physically sort of excluded to, 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 a, to, a, to a, you know, periphery. At that place, even if you try out these protective discolorations, the Hindu runs you to earth. He found, finds you out by somehow extracting from you your caste name. And that's why Ambedkar says it is simply not enough to assume this tactic of protective discoloration. What you must do is convert. Conversion is the next new name, not the, the intermediate name, but a radical new name, a new name to totally delocalize your locality. Now, this to Ambedkar is the real question of the theory of conversion, that conversion is to convert to a new name, such that you are able to delocalize yourself from that locality, which is an oppressive locality, which is a discriminatory locality. which can be the physical locality of the village, but also the locality of Hindu social order. But the question is, what will this new name be? In other words, what will be the new religion with a new name? And in a way, the entire struggle between 1935-36 to 1956 was this for So I will now conclude. <clears throat> now, either the new name can be something which is like I, you know, gave the example of Christianity, which is a new name to a particular society. So if a new religion comes with a new name like Christianity, at least at a more sort of prominent, in a more prominent way with the colonial rule, then that particular religion, which is a religion totally outside the Hindu religion can be considered an option to uh, to convert to insofar as it gives you the power of a new name. But a new name which is not a totally new name. It is a new name only in the cultural context of the old names. But the real question is that does that mean that you actually move into the theology of Christianity, into the rituals of Christianity? Now, interestingly, Ambedkar had used the Christian analogy earlier. He had said, even in the 1920s, that the untouchables must be like the Protestant Hindus. You know, like Protestant Christianity is a break from Catholic Christianity or dominant Christianity in the history of Christianity. In the same way, we must, in a sense, become Protestants vis-a-vis -vis Hinduism. But that is an analogy. Here is talking about something far more concrete and literal to become Christian. Does that mean that you move into Christian theology? Of course, this is a complicated question. I don't have the time to you know, discuss this. It's a question of monotheisms, one God and so on and so forth. <clears throat> Ambedkar does not really interest himself in theology. That is, uh, you know, something we have to be very sort of uh, very, very frank about, but also very rigorous about. He does not really undertake deep theological studies. He takes theology as a set, set, set of propositions for which a logical, reasonable explanation must be found. In that sense, he's a scientist of even of religion. He has a scientific attitude to religion. 
So he is not really worried that much about theology. So in that sense, the example of Christianity is not an example of a new theology in a, you know, in a particularly uh, sort of um, revolutionary sense. But at the same time, he does look for something new in religion, something almost revolutionary in religion. This is really the question. So on the one hand, he thinks Christianity is the possible new name which the, Indi the, the, the untouchable population of India can assume. But if Christianity were at the same level with an openly discriminatory social order, then of course, Ambedkar could not in any way subscribe to Christianity, even as a, an example or as an analogy. So of course, Gandhi and Ambedkar are pretty you know, akin here. They both think that the example of Jesus Christ is a revolutionary, emancipatory example. But the difference is Gandhi thinks of Jesus Christ as separate from Christian social order. Gandhi thinks of Jesus Christ as a kind of pure godly human being. Ambedkar on the other hand says that Jesus Christ is inseparable from a new principle of religion which Christianity at least partly institutionalizes and that is the principle of equality the principle of human brotherhood, fraternity. Though, of course, in the history of any religion, even these principles get, you know, spoiled. But that apart, it at least has that principle, which according to him, Hinduism does not. So again, the question of principle and religion come, comes back. So you see what happens between 1936 and 1956, by and large, is this. That Ambedkar relentlessly searches for both a particular religious name, including the name Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, these three, you know, in a, in a very intense way. And at the same time, he wants to, through all of these historical explorations and researches, he also wants to produce a theory of religion itself as a form of reason. And if in 1956 he eventually chooses not Christianity, not Sikhism, not Islam, but Buddhism, then of course a whole series of new questions arise. And why does he choose Buddhism? And why does he not merely choose Buddhism? Why does he, while choosing Buddhism, actually produce a text in 1955-56 which he himself writes called the Gospel of Buddha or the Buddha and his Dhamma, which he earlier wanted to call the Gospel of Buddha, very much in line with the Gospel in the, in the monotheistic book sense, the book of religion sense. Why does he do both things at the same time? According to me, and I can't demonstrate it here, but let me just assert it and you know, end my lecture. According to me, he does not choose Buddhism because Buddhism is a Indic religion as different from Christianity or uh, Islam, Sikhism is also Indic, after all. So I don't think that is the critical or the, or the, or the um, decisive parameter. I think the main question that he wants to address is, in which religion do you, do you find the rudiments of the principles of reason? which include reason of freedom, reason of equality, and reason of brotherhood or fraternity. And at the same time, where can these principles be consolidated in a religious form, including the form of a religious text as an act of will, the same will that he and his people embody. And you can only do that with a religion which historically is actually in a state of weakness rather than a religion which is already a kind of strong world religion or even an Indic religion. Islam and Christianity are strong world religions. Sikhism is a very powerful Indic religion and also a world religion, why not? Buddhism is one of the richest world religions with a particular kind of anti-theological understanding of things like God and so on and so forth. But in a state of decline in the early 20th century. So 
exactly where a religion is in decline and yet consists of emancipatory egalitarian universal principles of reason can you intervene to produce a kind of autonomous act of willing that religion and embodying that will in a particular set of new uh, a new textual form of you know organizing your thoughts of expressing your thoughts which is ambedkar's book the buddha and his dhamma he can only produce a new gospel of an old religion because that old religion is in a state of decline. So Ambedkar criticizes Buddhism for its decline of the organization of Sangha, but in a way it's to its advantage because he can then intervene in that very decline and produce a rejuvenated emancipatory egalitarian text, which he can, you know, autonomously call the Buddha and his Dhamma, which obviously cannot write a Christian Bible or an Islamic Quran or any such thing uh, in that particular conjuncture of the history of those religions. To me, this seems the most rational explanation for Ambedkar's choice of Buddhism, as well as his uh, own conversion to Buddhism, which of course also becomes a kind of platform and inspiration for millions of lakhs of uh, his, his people and people in, as such to convert. That's a story which we need to read very slowly and very carefully. And all these you know, points that I have raised at the end uh, need to be discussed threadbare. So let me end here and thank you again for the invitation and for your attention. But I would really want to hear your responses and your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Chaudhary, for uh, your enlightening uh, lecture. You have really taken us uh, for a wonderful journey of uh, Dr. Ambedkar's intellect intellectualization of uh, conversion, that how he understood conversion in political, in social, and also in the context, uh, in the cultural context. Now I uh, open the session uh, for the questions. So I request uh, the participants to kindly uh, raise their comments uh, or the questions. Maybe we can have uh, a small discussion, small debate, uh, Professor Chaudhary is, uh, is, is, is eager to have your questions. If there is any question, you can uh, open up your microphone or you can write in the chat box as well. So before uh, uh, any question come, uh, Professor Chaudhary, uh, I really like uh, when you said that, uh, you know, the dislocating the oppressive uh, localities, right? I mean, I really love uh, these words. Uh, because it, it has a deep meaning and also the socio-cultural context. And uh, as uh, we uh, all are aware, the statement that uh, Dr. Ambedkar made that the religion is for man and uh, uh, man uh, and not man for religion. If you want to gain self-respect, change your religion. If you want to organize yourself, change your religion. So here, here he is emphasizing on two facts, that is uh, the self-respect and the second is uh, the social organization, right? So somewhere we can relate it to educate, uh, uh, agitate and organize his famous statement. But anyway, I'm not drawing your attention to this. I'm drawing your attention to what Periyar has quoted about conversion, Periyar Ramaswami Naikar. So Periyar's views was a little bit uh, different from the views of Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, right? Rather, uh, if I am not mistaken, Periyar has advised Dr. B. R. Ambedkar that Baba Sahib, please don't convert. You, if you if you have to uh, fight for the inequality and the social evils uh, of the Hinduism, you have to be in the Hinduism, right? So uh, see that. So there has been, you know, uh, the differences of opinion among these two great minds. So how do you see this debate? Uh, between uh, Periyar and uh, Dr. Ambedkar, Periyar's views on conversion and Baba Sahib's view on conversion, sir. Over to you, sir. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, th those those citations, quotations from Ambedkar are actually part of the YOLA, uh, the YOLA announcement, uh, the one I mentioned. Uh, religion is for man, not man for religion. Uh, yes, sir. And yeah. so, so in each of these, uh, these uh, uh, announcements, he actually brought out uh, the the question of what I call man's capacity 
to institute a form which is religious rather than religion is something which comes from a, an area of unthought surplus or power or transcendence which uh, man has to accept as something over which he has no control. So this is actually part of his Yola announcement. Um, not his, sorry, 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 no, 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 no. Not his Yola announcement. This is uh, part of his Mahar that he, that he gave. Yeah. Uh, there, there in 1936. There he actually, uh, you know, though of course he speaks of these things in different places, but he actually enunciates them or announces them in a particular poetic manner for everyone to listen to. Uh, so, so, so yes. Uh, so this is just a, just a historical point. Now on Periyar and Ambedkar, see, of course, Periyar's own trajectory is very complicated. And uh, as we know that he himself uh, took a great favor to Islam towards the last part of his life. And uh, at the same time, just like Periyar, there were other people. Uh, you know, Mansode was there in the uh, in the uh, Mahar movement itself, who strongly um, who strongly opposed Ambedkar's uh, uh, move to convert to to conversion, and and made the same kind of um, appeal that um, Periyar made that within within the fold you have to you have to work and uh, you have to. Now the thing is, we must again understand that Ambedkar. Uh, was not really uh, speaking only of religion as a kind of uh, ritual order or a religious uh, practices that we call ritual religious practices in society. For him, religion was really a site of the exercise of power uh, in the in the most uh, granulated, in the most uh, in minute sense. Religion was really a site of a certain kind of legitimation and repetition of power exercised over the bodies of others or the, the oppressed and the untouchables uh, in a way that couldn't be only localized to the ritual space or the or the or the or the religious uh, practices so in that sense the word religion itself is not reducible to only practices religion includes the books religion includes our acceptance of certain kinds of notions like destiny Religion includes a certain sense of uh, uh, our, um, uh, and this is something which is being revived more and more today, uh, religion as something sanatan, immemorial, something which comes before us and will outlast us. In that sense, religion as the other of history, or even the enemy of history, or the, you know, the, the, the supervisor of history. All of these things for Ambedkar needed to be opposed both theoretically and existentially. Now, theoretically, of course, he had been doing it all his life. But for him, existentially, it was something which needed to be enacted, which needed to be embodied in a kind of gesture, in an act. And that act, he, he thought, would be an act of taking a new name, to, to, to give that new name a new body incorporate that new name in a whole set of new practices. So, of course, practices came back in Ambedkar. So one of the things that you find in Ambedkar's own conversion uh, is that he created so many new practices of the vows, of the oaths, which were not at all the same as the traditional Buddhist uh, oaths at all. So, in a sense, Ambedkar was again trying to embody new practices, but embody them in the light of the enunciation of a new principle, which he thought was revolutionary. So for him, really, religion, so the difference is for Periyar and several others, religion is a, is a place of improvement, of reform, of correction. Or religion is something which has to be rejected, like Marxists and atheists uh, in their own right reject religion, because it's, it's mystification. It's a kind of it's a kind of imaginary world that is created in the place of the real world and its contradictions. For Ambedkar, both of these positions were actually not false. That there has to be reform, correction, because there is always religion. And at the same time, a religion as theology, religion as doctrine of God is imaginary is a kind of substitution for the contradictions of real of the real world partly at least
But at the same time, religion itself was something different from these two aspects. And that is why Ambedkar is doing something quite extraordinary. So he's doing two things which I find exceptional, which I don't find usually in works on religion, whether they be by well-known social reformers or theologians, or even, you know, atheists, materialists. And those two are, to repeat, one is that he's thinking of religion from the position of the, of the outsider to majoritarian religions, to great religions, to world religions. He's thinking of religion as a universal possibility of constituting an emancipatory form of life, but from someone who's excluded from any universality of historical religions. He's thinking as a minoritarian thinker. And yet he's trying to you know, produce a theory of universal religion. That's the first thing. Second thing what he's doing is even more interesting. In Buddha and his Dhamma, he's writing a gospel, just like you know the Bible or the old text of Buddha. What is a gospel? The gospel is the truth as it is spoken, revealed. And that's the format, apparently, of Ambedkar's text also, because his text is not at all written like a philosophical text. It's written as a narrative. But one of the dimensions of that narrative is that Buddhism is able to give you a a universal theory of rational religion. Or let's put it this way. You want to test Buddhism just like any other religion on the on the on the on the on the on the measure or on the grounds of whether any such religion satisfies the condition of rationality, universal rationality, universal thinkability. So you see, it's a strange situation. You are doing it in the name of a new name, Buddhism in this case, a new old name, of course, like I said, a new name which must gain a new kind of force, a new universal force, a new old name, Buddhism. But you're not saying Buddhism is the greatest religion simply. He's saying that test Buddhism, including every other religion, on the grounds of universal rational religion, which is universal, which is religion as such, a kind of philosophy of religion. What kind of a gospel is this? Because the gospel is meant to propagate. But if you, in your propaganda, say, say to the people, but use your reason. Test every religion, including Buddhism or X religion to which you are apparently, you know, providing the propaganda. Test X also on the grounds of universal reason. Then who knows? Even X might fail that test. Test. You know. So this is an amazing combination of analytical appeal to everyone's intellectual capacity and at the same time to uh, the power of a new name, which is Buddhism during his conversion. So this Ambedkarite Buddhism is definitely not really at the same level as the history of religion as a historical cultural tradition, which then gives a lot of people the scope to say, Ambedkar's Buddhism is a kind of idiosyncrasy. It is a kind of, you know, whim. It is a kind of creation, something willful. While the history of religions will include Buddhism as part of Indic religions. Now, I find this, I find this in a way interesting, if you say that, because in a way Ambedkar indeed wanted to make Buddhism consistent with his will, not just his personal will, but the will of a thinking people the will of a people who are capable of thinking their own freedom, their sort of, you know, their emancipation from oppression. Rather than sort of relocalizing Buddhism within the so-called Indic uh, narrative, which is, of course, very, I mean, which is absolutely all right. You can do that. A lot of people are doing it. No problem. But I don't think that is Ambedkar's uh, point of intervention. That's the reason why he will not do it within Hinduism because Hinduism is already in your own, you know, what the point that you raised, uh, it's too localized. It's too localized and he needs some kind of a delocalizing gesture. But that gesture is very complicated. It is not a simple gesture. So, yeah, that's my answer. Interesting. Uh, well, that uh, takes me to another point. Yeah. Uh, 
sir, I just want to ask you, if I say that uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar's uh, Buddha yeah. or his uh, Buddhist philosophy, religion, and uh, he has understood and look at the Buddha, not only from, uh, you know, a social perspective, but also from the political perspective. So basically, he was trying to look for a system. He was trying to visualize a kind of system. And here I want to uh, uh, draw your attention to uh, his uh, teacher and uh, professor from Columbia University, John Dewey. Uh, if I say that uh, he was a uh, he was, uh, you know, he, he was famous for pragmatism, right? I mean, he was uh, a pragmatic. Uh, he was he basically written on that. So, what uh, would would that assertion be correct, right? That somewhere the principles of John Dewey inspired Dr. B. R. Ambedkar to construct such a wonderful experiment, which has never happened before uh, in the human history. You know, because I really don't want to uh, look at it uh, from the Protestant movement, uh, which happened in the 15th century, you know, against the Catholic Church. This is something different. This is something different. You are basically creating a transformative model. So, sir, reference to Dewey, what is your take on it? Yeah, yeah, that's a very important reference. That's a crucial reference. So uh, in Dewey, you find uh, a pragmatic philosopher. Pragmatic should not be misunderstood as instrumental or merely practical thinking. Pragmatic means life. Pragmatic means something which is lived, something uh, where thought is not abstract, thought is not disembodied. Thought is in the same duration or in the same flowing movement as life is. So that's why in this text, away from the Hindus, actually Ambedkar speaks of the anthropological subsoil of religion in something which promotes life values. He says those religions which produce life values. So I should have spoken about it. Thank you for your question. It gives me a chance to bring this out. Uh, it is not just thinking in the abstract, disembodied sort of uh, academic sense. For him, thinking is the same kind of act which, and this is a point that comes from Dewey, which is uh, the flow of life forms, life values. So he says those religions which eventually promote life, life as a value, life force, are the religions which are also more universal. And those religions which actually block life values or life force or the value of life as a force are religions which become corrosive and oppressive. So this, this, to me, this particular thinking is deeply uh, linked to Dewey's philosophy. I myself am not a Dewey, so-called specialist in Dewey. Um, that is not important. Uh, these two thinkers in American history of philosophy, Dewey and uh, William James, are actually extraordinary thinkers precisely because for them philosophy was uh, not really a scholastic ivory tower affair at all. But uh, philosophy was a kind of public, um, a public, uh, an act of public uh, promotion of life values and and for for uh, for Ambedkar indeed uh, the, the the greatest hope in religion was to uh, somehow be able to create transformation not just in the ideal sense but in the sense of something which is living and which is uh, which which is and I have you know used this term in my book which is embodied in new dispositions. So this idea of Dewey is a dispositional idea rather than a merely a theoretical or merely an abstract idea of philosophy. So yes, yes, that is a very important thing. That this new, what is equality? Equality is the disposition of equality towards, towards others, not just in principle, but in reality, in their bodily life, in their material life, in their very encounters with each other. So that's why one of the most beautiful parts of Annihilation of Caste actually is very close to Dewey's thinking when Ambedkar says that when is it that we form a kind of new, a new subjectivity? That could be the subjectivity of a nation. That could be the subjectivity of a new, uh, a, a, a new form of collectivity, whatever it is. But that subjectivity is when we, he says, when we experience a new common feeling 
It is not a personal feeling, private feeling. And yet it is a feeling, a new intensity, a new flow of life that moves through each of us. And this is very close to Dewey's own thinking. That life is both something which is transpersonal, in that sense, literally transformative. It, it moves through a kind of trans movement. It is never something localized to a corporate separation. It is always moving through, uh, through channels, through forms. It is itself not exclusive to a single form. Life is more than one form. And yet, life is something which is not simply physical, not simply material, not simply bodily. Life is also something which is, uh, which is the, uh, the continuous modification of our habits. So transformation is also the transformation of thinking that produces new habits, new dispositions. So yes, absolutely, I agree with you that uh, this transformative, um, transformative vision of uh, religion as a kind of universal dispositional life of, of a people is far beyond any historical religion, including Protestant or whatever, you know, whatever historical um, local religious name we can take from any religion, doesn't matter. This is much, much greater than that. And it is indeed, someone would say, philosophical more than religious. So yes, yes, absolutely. I agree with you. And uh, this discourse uh, finally take us to what happened after Mahapari Nirvana of uh, Dr. B.R. Ambedkar, yeah. right? I think within six months, uh, he died after conversion. Now, how do you see uh, uh, today's uh, politics of uh, conversion or uh, how, do ha how do you see uh, the journey of uh, those who have uh, then converted with Dr. B.R. Ambedkar? I'm, I'm simply uh, curious to understand Yes, yes, yes. What become of them, right? Yeah. What I mean, happened there, there, to them socially yeah. as well as politically? How do you see that? Yeah. The many, many, many dimensions of this. The uh, the problem of conversion in general, as it is being understood and as it is being dealt with by again social and political power, like including the state and political organizations today who take up the question of conversion in a certain way that we know and we, we should talk about it. That's one thing. And the other thing is uh, following Ambedkar's own conversion, uh, what happened to the movement as such? Well, uh, on the one hand, a very strong current of what could be called Dalit Buddhist uh, thinking, politics, as part of the emancipatory transformational politics uh, did um, you know, come into being, no doubt, and it, it has a great force even today. Uh, so the very idea of Bahujan itself would be impossible without the um, combination, in a sense, of Dalit and Buddhist um, thinking, but within a particular Ambedkarai discipline, it seems to me, not in general merely. Uh, so that is one thing. But at the same time, I think we have to accept that the great hope that Ambedkar put into Buddhism, not just as a religion to convert to, but what could also be called a kind of new internationalism, a kind of world possibility, which is in evidence when Ambedkar made his last fantastic speech, Marx and Ambedkar, I'm uh, sorry, Marx and Buddha, that speech he made in Kathmandu. Um, there he actually is thinking of something which is a horizon of a new Buddhist internationalism and a kind of uh, uh, not a not a enemy rivalry but a kind of uh, uh, but but a kind of fraternal rivalry with with communism at that time as as possible options of uh, world transformation of world systems and as critiques of capitalism capitalist world order uh, that hope um, in the next several years has definitely only gone into decline, if not total disappearance, total, uh, you know, uh, has, has entirely disappeared. Uh, well, for many reasons, uh, I don't think we need to go into them. Um, but one of the things that we have to keep in mind is uh, one uh, that the 
the, the misunderstanding that there can be an essence of religion, that there is a kind of essence of religion such that one religion has a better essence than another. Uh, that is a very uh, dangerous misapplication of Ambedkarite thinking, that Buddhism has an essence which is superior to other essences. Uh, so uh, from that could follow a kind of dogmatic uh, faith in Buddhist Buddhist uh, politics also. So it would be really very difficult to sustain such a politics. Suppose we take the case of Burma today or even Sri Lanka or other states which could be Buddhist states with extremely oppressive regimes in the name of Buddhism. Now you could always say that these are perversions of Buddhism and they are. Who can doubt it? But at the same time in so far as they are institutions of a kind of political theology or a kind of theological power in forms of dictatorship and oppression. Uh, I think it, it is would be a misapplication or even kind of waste of time to look for an essence of a religion in the sense of essence of Christianity or essence of Buddhism or essence of any religion. In the case of Hinduism, of course, Ambedkar again and again showed that that essence is a contradictory essence in any case. That is a different discussion. Uh, so, so in that sense, oh, I think oh, we should be careful about uh, about looking at uh, Ambedkar's inheritance as a kind of Buddhist inheritance. I do not quite subscribe to that kind of thinking. I mean, I have had occasions when, in some public discussions, some people who have very strongly, you know, who subscribe to Ambedkarite Buddhism have said. Don't even mention the word Dalit, because after all, Buddhism encompasses everything. Ambedkarite Buddhism, uh, uh, kind of new Nava Buddhism in Marathi. I have even heard one person who was very young at that time who converted with um, with Ambedkar in 1956. I met him in Nagalok uh, last year, a couple of years back, and he did not even like the term Nava Buddhism. Because he thought that is too much of a new name in the sense of a separate name. He wanted the old name Buddhism. He said, everything is Buddhism. Why talk of Ambedkarite Buddhism? For him, there was no distinction between Ambedkarite Buddhism and Buddhism, though he meant Ambedkarite Buddhism is indeed a revolutionary you know, change from just any other religion. But he doesn't like the, the so-called name Ambedkarite Buddhism as something separate. He wants just Buddhism, a kind of universal name. So all these, all these uh, interesting, fascinating sort of uh, vacillations are there in the in the history of religion, including the history of its name. Uh, but by and large, we have to we have to accept that all of this, if it is limited to a Buddhist inheritance, then it is a it is a very important but a small inheritance. But it is a great inheritance if it is taken as something which Ambedkar himself called called the thinking of the possibility of a new revolution or a kind of revolutionary paradigm of thinking. So Buddhism is only part of a revolutionary paradigm. If we think of a large revolutionary paradigm, then indeed, it seems to me between Buddhism and Dalit politics, a kind of revolutionary hypothesis or a revolutionary paradigm in the 1960s and 70s, post Ambedkar, did, did emerge in the history of India, to which the present tremendous reaction is a kind of reaction to that force, to that force in the 60s and 70s. It is not simply an intra-party Congress BJP difficulty. It is, I think, a larger social reaction to some tremendous upheavals that have taken place post Ambedkar, but as part of Ambedkarite thinking, particularly in the late 60s and 70s, uh, maybe through Maharashtra, but not just limited to Maharashtra. Uh, so that is a large uh, perspective that I um, place before you. Now, on the specific uh, uh, problems of today's um, situation, uh, well, it seems to me that the the uh, revivalism of what is called Gharvapasi, sort of return to one's own fold uh, uh, in among among Hindu organizations and so on and so forth, which we well know about actually testifies to a kind of pessimism about religion as different from Ambedkar's rational optimism about religion. It seems to me that today there are two things about which the great religious sort of, you know, violently um, 
forceful statements that come from religion, Hindu religion and so on and so forth, majoritarian religion, uh, actually are pessimistic about religion. Why? One, they are pessimistic because they do not think that there is any great revolutionary change possible within religion. They think religion is a matter of exactly what Ambedkar wanted to exit. is a matter of uh, fate, matter of social fate. Let's put it like this. Not divine fate, not, you know, something which actually comes from the heavens, but social fate. So if you are born a Hindu, then it is social fate. And so there is no way you can ever call yourself anything else. Now that the social fate is intrinsically majoritarian because the majoritarian has some benefits to gain from this kind of social fatalism is something which is not difficult to see. But the fact that this social fatalism can today work uh, with uh, so much violence, but at the same time with some success through the state machinery and so on and so forth, is because it is more or less a corrosive social consensus that nothing new can happen in religion. Nothing new can happen through religion. So that's why any conversion, any act of will vis-a-vis -vis taking up a new religious identity must be something which is petty. There must be some other motive behind it. It couldn't be actually religious. Ambedkar had the great rational hope that by moving into a new name, some kind of a new being would come into being. But if that hope crashes or that hope is deliberately killed, crushed, then indeed you would say that if you want to convert to any other religion from say Hindu, being a Hindu, then there must be something behind it. There must be some power game, some other motive. One of the motives that we see today is a kind of what is called biopolitical motive. That oh, some other religion is wanting to play the game of numbers. They want to increase their numbers. They want to create a population asymmetry amongst what is called communities. So it is a communitarian understanding of Religion where community has nothing to do with fraternity. Community has something to do with population. With the weight of numbers. Which of course is also translatable into weight of votes. Right? So this uh, this to me is 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 the one of the one of the sort of blanks on which this kind of a terrible violence against the very thought of conversion today is 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 practiced socially. Finally, I would say that you know it is also something which comes from another quarter, which is, on the one hand, this pessimism about religion, and on the other hand, this terrible difficulty with modernity, with modern ideas of freedom. Ambedkar wanted the two absolutely together. Whether it is possible to think of them together is something we can debate. But he, at least, absolutely, frankly, publicly put the two together. Today, it seems to me, the idea of a kind of modern individual life in a society like India is really something which is now the center of a new contradiction. The contradiction of economic corporatism, which needs that kind of individualism, and social fatalism, which absolutely cannot tolerate that kind of individual freedom, particularly seen in such things as the freedom to marry, the freedom to love, the freedom to have a kind of life of one's own life on, of one's own choices. Absolutely intolerable for this pessimistic social fatalism. And yet, it is apparently something that you must, you know, you must accept as a value if you want uh, what is called development as part of individualist economic prosperity. So that contradiction is, a, is something that we are experiencing uh, with, with unfortunate violence. Yeah. Right. Uh, sir, uh, well, it's almost uh, 4.45 now, and uh, we really appreciate, you know, uh, the time that you have given to us. And uh, the most important thing is uh, the, the goodness of this platform, or rather the virtue that we try to create, is to encourage people to think, you know. So this is basically a purpose of this platform. How could a mid-correct perspective can help us in understanding this world? Uh, yours, uh, 
is a sixth lecture as i have already mentioned so this is what we are learning as a student of uh, ambed uh, ambedkarism or the ambedkarite philosophy this is exactly what we are learning we are learning to see the model of understanding you know through which we can see the world and that model is uh, ambedkarism the ambedkarite philosophy so sir your contribution to our efforts uh, is really appreciated and i'm 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 personally you know very grateful to you that uh, we got an opportunity to learn so much from you uh, sir uh, i also request you to you know whenever possible after this pandemic uh, let's meet personally you come to our college oh yeah and... i'd love to i'd love to but <laughs> I, i'm sure there's no one else so because i can see a lot of icons on the on the screen yeah no but no nobody is asking any question no nobody, nobody is commenting but anyway sir it happens <laughs> No yeah but anyway the most important thing is people participated uh, and we had a good number of people and i'm really appreciating uh, for I'm their grateful. patience as well i'm very grateful for your invitation and also uh, for your attention also these these uh, extremely uh, interesting questions that you put to me thank you sir thank you so so with these words i declare that the program has been successfully concluded and so thank you so much we'll keep in touch thank and have a great you. evening ahead and have a great evening ahead to you as well mr pa the dear participants you know for your time and as well as for your patience thank you thank you very much thank you sir